Hi everyone, thank you for joining us today um, and welcome to the third annual Plastic Free Beauty Day. Uh, my name is Yolanda, I am the founder of Plastic Free Beauty Day and I'm also the founder of Plastic Free Beauty brand, We Are Paradox. So I launched Plastic Free Beauty Day three years ago with the mission to create real positive change within the beauty industry. And there is a reason that today is not called Sustainable Beauty Day or Green Beauty Day. It's really to highlight the issues that we have found and that there is around the use of plastic specifically within the beauty industry, as we firmly believe that there is no such thing as good plastic. So that's what we're going to discuss today. I am absolutely thrilled to have uh, the people that we have on the panel today. We are with some of the industry's biggest change makers. Uh, we have Millie Kendall, who you all know. Thank you, Millie, for hosting this with British Beauty Council today. Uh, Millie has spent um, the last 30 years building and supporting beauty brands and who established the Sustainable Beauty Coalition to address the beauty industry's response to the ongoing climate and ecolo uh, ecological uh, crisis. So thank you, Millie, for joining us. We also have uh, Daisy Kendrick. She is a sustainability expert from Ocean Generation, uh, which is an inclusive global movement that exists to restore a sustainable relationship between humanity and the ocean. So welcome, Daisy. And finally, we have Ben Proctor from On Repeat, a brand new service offering beauty brands a bespoke zero waste packaging and fulfillment solution to supply refills to their customers. So a really new and innovative approach for our industry. So thank you, Ben. Uh, so we're going to get straight to it today. Um, we're going to do just a few questions. Um, I'm going to direct the first uh, one to each of the three of you, but please feel free um, to, to join in the conversation. If you would like to ask any questions to the panelists, please use the Q&A. Um, and once we're finished with the initial conversation, we'll come back for questions at the end. Uh, and I hope you all enjoy today's um, discussion. So the first question for uh, Daisy. So your organization is really the authority on plastic pollution. We may all have heard that stat, that shocking stat, that by 2050, there will be more plastic in the sea from fish. So I hopefully, hopefully everyone on uh, today's webinar will have heard that. But there are also some more shocking statistics that we may not have heard. So Daisy, do you want to maybe just talk us through some of the things that we need to be aware of in terms of our plastic impact on uh, the world's ecosystems? Yeah, sure. Thank you so much for having me. Um, as you mentioned, you know, that's kind of the big fact recently that's garnered headlines with, you know, more plastic than fish in the sea. Um, but our oceans are so critical to all life on Earth. Not only do they provide over 50% of the oxygen that we breathe, they're a huge carbon sink and capture carbon from the air, but they're also 80% of our planet's biodiversity belongs in our oceans. But over 12 tons of plastic are entering our oceans. That's literally a rubbish truck full of plastic every minute enter our oceans. And a huge contributor to that is the beauty industry and the billions of units of plastic that end up in landfill and ultimately our waterways and our oceans um, from our beauty packaging and the things that we use in our daily lives and our bathrooms, etc. cetera. Um, and that's the thing is that most of the plastics in our oceans start from land. And so we need to start building that connection between what we're using in our daily lives and how that ends up in our waterways and start connecting um, this narrative so that we can start making positive changes to find alternatives and start helping both our oceans and our planet in general. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think... Um... One of the big misconceptions that I'm sure is going to come out of today uh, is the use of bioplastics. So um, what is your opinion on that? Um, so bioplastics are technically um, mater plastic materials that are reduced from biomass sources such as like vegetable fats or corn or um, wood chips or um, recycled food waste from the agricultural sector. Um, 
Commercially, they actually currently only make up just a small amount of alternative wrapping sources that we have, but there's lots of noise around bioplastics with people saying that, you know, these are incredible, these can be alternatives. Um, but we have to be really careful and we have to um, educate ourselves and do proper research because a lot of these bioplastics actually still derive from fossil fuels. Um, like normal plastics do. Um, and in their creation to their energy production, et cetera, they can actually be more polluting than normal plastic. So um, there's a few myths that we have to debunk and um, be careful with labeling when it comes to these bioplastics that are not necessarily always true. Yeah, I think one of the things that I'm saying, you know, with with a lot of brands that are striving to be more sustainable, and it, it's great that they're, you know, they're on that mission, but there is a, a kind of a lack of awareness around the bioplastic subject, and it is, you know, it feels like, oh, well, we're eco because our plastic is bio, but in fact, isn't there something about how it breaks down that it actually needs very specific conditions, which it often doesn't get? Exactly. So, um, you know, if you're just going to put this alternative source in the normal rubbish bin, it doesn't have the conditions that it needs to be biodegradable and break down naturally. If we're just putting that into our into our normal bin, then it's not serving the purpose that it was created for. But again, this goes back to education and understanding because, you know, how are we at home supposed to know if this product says, oh, you know, we're um, alternative plastic, it still doesn't give us enough instructions, et cetera, to be able to do something else with that. So again, it goes back to educating both consumer and brands to understand really, is this making a difference? Is this the right choice? Or is this just an easy choice for brands to use um, and greenwash essentially with these alternative packaging sources? Thank you for that. Um, following on to that then actually, Millie, so you've kind of worn every single hat there is to wear, I think, within the beauty industry. So you've been a beauty brand. Very, fan. very old. <laughs> At my age, yeah. Um, I think, am I right in thinking you started your career within the beauty industry as a brand finder? And then you've also worn the retailer hat, consultant. You're obviously head of the British beauty. Yeah, and I actually started in, in hairdressing as a junior. So, oh. yeah, yeah. That's something Long I did before that decades ago, but yes, you definitely covered every every I, angle, I covered every job in the industry. Yeah, I think you've seen probably the the good, bad, and the the ugly. Um, why? So Dizzy has sort of set the context, I guess, with the the wider impact that um you know plastic has on the the world. But what is it about the beauty industry specifically, and why should we you know take action and really play an active role? In, uh, in the world sustainability efforts? Well, I mean, I think the beauty industry reaches a lot of people, if not everyone. <laughs> you know, we're all, we all wash, um, we all brush our teeth. So um, we've got a very wide reach. We're also consumables. So people use our products and then chuck away the, plus, the packaging, very similar to food. So um, I think our reach is, very, is vast and I think that's really important to consider. Um, and, we also are an industry that has used um, marketing claims and initiatives that I don't think have been, frankly, very transparent um, and very beneficial to the planet. So I think a lot of times we sort of cannibalize our own industry by, by not being very clear. So saying recyclable, is great, but you're putting the onus on the consumer and most of the consumers don't know what that, that doesn't mean that it's recycled. So we kind of tend to confuse the consumer a little bit and we need to take responsibility for that. And, you know, in the research that we did, so we, we conducted um, a commissioned a report called The Courage to Change. And we, um, we did a piece of research that was both industry and consumer and the consumers want this. They want us to be more responsible and they want us to make the change and they want us to shout out loud and they want us to be courageous and sort of transition and reinvent our industry so that we're more conscious and more responsible. Um, so in order for us to future-proof our sector, we need to make changes now because we are going to lose the respect of the consumer if we don't. So um, I think the sort of the stats were something like 96% of the consumers that in our research that was conducted by Hubbub on behalf of the British Beauty Council believe their own actions make a difference. Mm -hmm. Well, if 96% of consumers believe that, what about our industry? Yeah. 
you know, we can do better. Um, you know, we need to invest in infrastructure. We need to invest in manufacturing. We need to invest in packaging technology and designers that can develop the packaging of the future. Um, I, I think in some respects, we've been guilty of being a bit lazy. Mm -hmm. um, not everybody, but I think in, in some respects, I think there's there's been some laziness and some complacency, really. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think, you know, while some of the, the stats that Daisy showed was, was fairly shocking, I think, you know, reading your report and, and some other statistics around the beauty industry specifically is kind of just as shocking. Like, you know, I've, I've actually got some here. 142 billion units of packaging is produced by the beauty industry every single year. And the majority of that is plastic. Yeah. And the majority of that ends up at landfill. Like we're not, you know, we're talking real serious volume here. Yeah. And also, you know, a more recent stat that came out, um, I can't remember the report now, but it was 95% of beauty packaging is thrown out after one use. So kind of to touch on, you know, your, your I think you've both mentioned the recyclability element of it. For me, it kind of doesn't matter that it's recyclable if it's not getting recycled. Yeah, 56% of consumers recycle their bathroom plastic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, no, 56 don't. That means only 44 do. Exactly. So even if we just tweak that number a bit, you know, an extra 20%, you know, we just need to kind of start to work towards making that happen. You know, it took us, took me personally a couple of years to go from walking into the supermarket and forgetting to take a bag to actually remembering to put one at every possible point so I can't forget it as I leave the house. Mm -hmm. But I've done it. You know, I have different bins in my bathroom. I have different bins in my kitchen. You know, I know that all the sort of different boroughs up and down the country, let's say specifically within the UK, have different recycling um, rules. Mm -hmm. um, and we're not going to change that overnight. But, you know, we need to, personally, I think we need to take some ownership as a consumer. Mm -hmm. I think the brands need to make it easier. I, I often find that, it's the the actuators and the the, the pipe the tubes that go into the bottle all of those little bits i'm fully aware of what that the actual mm -hmm. bulk of the bottle where i can put that but i just don't know where to put the rest of it yeah absolutely. because it's not clear what it's made of and they're different types of plastic and different types of plastic require different types mm -hmm. of recycling if indeed they can even be recycled so it's we and we use you know most most packs have how many parts i mean multiple parts to it so you know and we've made it quite we've made it easy for the consumer to dispense a product by putting a stopper in so the oil doesn't go all over the floor yeah. and all that kind of stuff but by making it easy for them we're sort of desecrating the ocean you yeah. know and we can't do that i mean i i have a 14 year old daughter who is so concerned about the ocean and i do believe that in 10 20 years from now their focus will be blue beauty it won't be about green it will be about blue yeah. the ocean will take precedence yeah. and so in in making it a little bit easier for her to apply a body oil mm -hmm. i'm actually contributing to that as, as a brand so not that I, have a brand. I don't have a brand anymore <laughs> i'm almost i'm almost relieved actually <laughs> <laughs> i'm sure you are yeah. um but no that that's that's part of it you know it is just you talking about the the dispensing side of things you know i think from my own brand perspective with my We Are Paradox hat on. So we make um, plastic free uh, hair and body care. And one of the things that we came up against was um, because we, we sit in the kind of premium side of things is that it still needs to be a premium experience. And so when we were formulating, you know, our super rich conditioner, we couldn't put that with a, a metal screw cap because it would just, you know, you'd be like smacking like a ketchup bottle. Yeah. Um, so we still needed the pump on top. And I was absolutely horrified when I searched the world for a completely metal pump and could not find it. So now we as a brand are taking that upon ourselves and we're actually making the industry's first plastic free pump that's fully metal. And we will we will share that, you know, with our our colleagues and our, our and other beauty brands. But it's, it's about what's available. And it's also about what is, I think we need to redefine what 
a premium or luxury experience needs to be like yeah. because I could quite easily reformulate that conditioner to make it pourable to not need that pump and give you the same efficacy and results but as consumers we need to to readjust I don't want that lovely pump in the bathroom I'm quite happy to pour it into my hand so I think it's about us kind of changing our perspective that's what Daisy said about education I mean somebody Ben's here's just said about sort of fragmentation and, and it is about the retailer not asking the brands to constantly deliver new, 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 new. It's about, you know, investing in the, the formulations being maybe adjusted. The consumer's understanding that the formulations are going to have to adjust in order to be in different packaging. Um, it's about packaging technology and design. And, you know, we got to the point here where we've got, you know, five parts in a pack. Well, why can't we just reduce that? It's down to us to educate the consumer and bring everyone together so that we've got some sort of the standard we can we can adjust the standard we created the situation we can uncreate it um we just need some unraveling and i think also what yolanda was mentioning with her brand that she's built um it's really important for different brands to be sharing their resources um and even between small and big because we often see not only in the beauty industry but many other industries it's the smaller brands that are investing in the research and the development and the alternatives and these people innovating really need the support of larger brands to get behind this, um, but also invest in that research and development. So it be can become industry wide as opposed to just a few small brands doing their part. It really needs the resources need to be shared and the conversations and the knowledge needs to open up. That's I, so true. Yeah. I, I couldn't agree with that more. I think, you know, we uh, for We Are Paradox kind of accidentally became the plastic free beauty brand you know I that the decision to go plastic free with our packaging was really just a personal decision of mine in the in the beginning I remember thinking I don't want to be personally responsible for hundreds of thousands of units of plastic and so we decided to to go aluminium but usually you know when you have and we, we were the first and still one of the very few that, that use aluminium and stainless steel because it's very expensive but you know naturally whenever you have a usp that you either create or stumble upon you want to keep it all for yourself whereas from the beginning you know i've said to my shareholders and investors and board no this has to be we have to be open source about this we have to share our knowledge and our findings and I actually even share our supplier list so if anybody you know is considering making that move please get in contact we're we're very open with here's how you do better here's how we've done it um and I think that's that's really key do you know that it's the sportswear industry have been really good like that mm -hmm. I want to say the Nike or Adidas came out with something that was really amazing some sort of new technology and they shared it with their competitors yeah and I think how they've how they've made that technology open source has been has been incredibly um it's enviable actually yeah, yeah. it's what it's really what yeah. we need to do thank you for that um moving on to to ben so your company on repeat is currently working on a solution to reduce plastic waste in our industry there's already been some comments about can you get in touch let us how what do you do and so on so can you tell us a little bit about um about that service and also maybe some of the the choices that brands and consumers should make when it comes to either producing or buying uh, beauty products with, you know, with regards to materials? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, it's great to see that there, there are alternatives, you know, um, you're using aluminium, which is fantastic, which is much more recyclable and reusable than, than plastics are, uh, glass as well. Um, and we've been developing a, a plastic free refill uh, packaging fulfillment solution for brands so that they can offer refills to their customers. So the packaging itself comes in two parts. We've got an outer cardboard wallet, in an interior pouch, which is made from different compostable and dissolvable films, depending on the product that we're filling. And then we send the refills to the customers who then decant the product into their existing bottle and they can then recycle and compost the packaging. So we spent the last year researching and testing about 50 different films um, to find something that we can use to hold liquids, but also something which um, practically can be disposed of. Uh, so just to sort of pick up on something which you've been talking about previously, it's all well and good finding things which say that they're recyclable or compostable, but we have to look at the whole system and the whole infrastructure to see whether or not that is actually something which is a, a good alternative or whether or not it's just as bad as using a conventional plastic. Mm -hmm. So a lot of our research has been uh, discussing the practicality of these compostable materials um, in the current infrastructure. 
And we've been having talks with, with RAP, for example, which is the, the Waste and Resources Action Programme, who can sort government and business and throughout the whole, the whole system, really, to bring everybody together as well, to make sure that, we're, that we have uh, the same message and that we're all doing the same thing, because as we've already been discussing, it's a collective effort, really, and everybody needs to be doing and contributing towards reducing plastic in order for it to be successful. And we've also been speaking to a lot of waste management facilities as well to see what happens to um, compostable and biodegradable plastics uh, at their end of life. So we've been speaking to a lot of anaerobic digestion facilities and industrial compost facilities as well to see what happens um, on that end. And then further to local authorities to see what happens and what the future holds for offering uh, curbside collection of, of these sorts of materials. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, it's been a, a huge research project and we really want to make sure that it's um, using uh, the best and the latest technology, but also that it's that it works within the framework that, that we currently have. So I think we'll constantly be sort of developing and adapting that depending on what local authority and government and, and brands uh, are asking for. Absolutely. I think, Ben, I think, well, you've touched on a couple of things. I think the, you know, the reuse is actually one of the, the biggest trends and, and um, conversation kind of topics that came out of last year's Plastic Free Beauty Day. You know, it is about um, having programs like yours to allow us to reuse because it does take, you know, it takes the brands to participate in that. And also the, the choice of materials, you know, you mentioned um, aluminium and glass, and I think there's there's still a lot of education to be done around that. Um, you know, people always still ask me why why I choose aluminium, and for me, it's really straightforward. It comes back to the the recycling point um, that, that I think everyone has kind of touched on now. If aluminium, so we know that most people do not recycle their beauty products and that they throw it out after the first um, use. For us to change that behavior is going to take a long time so i feel like in the interim it's it's not us as brands need to stop putting the onus on the customer and take responsibility for choosing materials that won't cause environmental damage when they reach those ecosystems so i am very aware that my aluminium is going to landfill and going to the sea until people and and councils and countries actually at country level begin to recycle but the difference is when it reaches those environments, it causes no env environmental damage. So, you know, even bioplastics that, that reach landfill will give off toxic gases. Um, you know, when, when plastic reaches sea, it gives off microplastics that fish eat. I think a recent study showed that 100% of fish that were tested had ingested plastic, like 100%, you know, and I feel like, well, at least when aluminium reaches there, it doesn't give off microplastics, it doesn't release those toxins. So it is about choosing those materials. Glass is the same. Now glass is slightly heavier, so has a, an impact on carbon footprint, but still to me is better because it's reusable, um, much more reusable than plastic. And I think, you know, the, the post-consumer recycled conversation that we have that, it, you know, it's okay because it's being recycled and reused and repurposed. Yes, but only for an infinite, or sorry, for a finite yeah. amount of times, you know, it's exactly. four to five It still minutes. doesn't go anywhere, does it? No, exactly. <laughs> I think there was um, something like, what was it? A pot of moisturizer takes a thousand years to decompose, decompose. Mm -hmm. Like that. My that's... body would decompose quicker. No. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know what, Millie, every, the, the, I guess the most shocking stat that I think I've ever heard is that every single piece of plastic ever produced from the beginning of the production of plastic still, here. still exists. Yeah, it's disgusting. Yeah. That is absolutely disgusting. It's disgusting. It's I disgusting. think also yeah. just to wait for the government to initiate this, the initiatives is sort of waiting too long. I mean, it's too long. It won't happen in, in our lifetime. I, no. I just, you know, even down to the sort of Paris Agreement, we're not really any further on, are we? So. No. You know, I think we can't wait around for somebody to tell us what to do. We know what to do. Yeah, you know, if ninety-six percent of, of people believe their own actions make a difference, that means that we all are feeling rather guilty that we're not doing enough. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I do, I do feel that you know, as consumers, as the industry, we just need to, um, you know, 
have the courage really to to, to, to make the changes we need and retailers particularly yeah I, I think there was one government example like two three years ago around the micro beads that in the UK the government officially banned uh micro beads yes. um in things like shower gel etc which was kind of on a policy level a win for the environment but I think that also goes like a question to brands is do you really want to wait until you have to be dictated by uh governing bodies or international organizations that you have to do an alternative no we should be doing things in advance and like you say with the might with with plastics taking 450 to a thousand years to decompose because then they break down break down might into microplastics um, which are considered less than five millimeters um in size you know that are then ingested by fish and if you eat fish then those are going into our bodies and you know it's it affects everything it's it's like everything is interconnected and something that um i learned by by getting involved in this um panel as well is that um in terms of microplastics there's a lot of kind of fillers that are put into beauty products from um shower gels etc to shampoos air, lots of beauty products that contain these microplastics um which automatically when we wash our hair wash our face wash our bodies and then going into our waterways and so i think that's also quite interesting um you know are there alternatives inside the products that brands could be using and not just on the outside with the packaging absolutely absolutely it, it is it's about it's about the whole thing that makes that that product up and also how we ship it like i remember buying um a perfume from a sustainable beauty brand uh, i'll mention no names and the the product itself was plastic free indeed and came in um, uh, a glass container as you would expect and so on and the outer packaging was bubble wrapped it had the you know the plastic peanuts it came in a plastic you know outer I just thought it's so I mean I think I think one of the questions we'll come to talks about you know how to spot the good from the bad but you know it's it's looking at that entire journey you know and, and how a product comes to you it's just you know what I, I actually think would be quite an interesting sort of solution so I recently and this is so not beauty related but I recently bought uh paper sandwich bags for my daughter to take her lunch to school in because I didn't want to use plastic bags or whatever but the package came in a plastic wrap mm -hmm. I thought it was just completely ridiculous obviously I'm buying those so that I don't use plastic yeah. and I think it would be very interesting if we were more transparent online when we're sort of putting our products mm -hmm. on a website to sort of almost have some disclosures to what the outer packaging is yep or <laughs> what the shipping packaging yep. is do yeah. you want your product shipped in X, Y, Z? No, I don't. And I, I think that, you know, there are sort of solutions to how we how we present our products to people yeah. um, that, that could be quite reasonably easy fixes if yeah. we just disclosed more. And Absolutely. Because as, as Ben mentioned, it's a journey, you know, there, there's, and it will always be a journey because it's based on technology and technology is always evolving, you know, and I think transparency, you know, from a brand perspective that we're not getting it all right. So, you know, I am always very open and honest with my, you know, we are a paradox hat that we're, we're not 100% plastic free. We're about 90%. We're edging more towards 95. Some of our products are 99% are completely plastic free. But, you know, as I mentioned, we have pumps in our shampoo and conditioner because we know our customers are wanting that but the latest one that came, that we came out with has a screw cap you know you talking about transparency of even information Millie on our website we show look he, this is all metal so you you dump that but because we're an indie brand we're very small we're having to use labels instead of direct print because our suppliers will only direct print once we're up to 20,000, you know, a run. Yeah. So, you know, we have to be able to tell our customer, look, before you recycle this, peel off the label, you know, and it, I think customers, you know, consumers and, and other brands respect us because we are. So look, we're not perfect. In a couple of years time, when we're doing 20,000 runs, there will be no plastic because we'll be printing. But until we're able to work with our suppliers to, to adjust those MOQs, you know, our hands are tied. And that's why the supply chain, the manufacturing needs investment. And that's where we would, you know, we've just created the Sustainable Beauty Coalition, which is to do exactly what you guys are asking, which is to bring the indie brands and large brands and retailers and sort of people really um, sort of influences in this area together. Um, and it is very much about ensuring that the supply chain is managed 
and those the, the, the investment is in the manufacturing piece because they wouldn't have to ask you to get to that MOQ if they had investment yeah. or support financial support from the government they would be able to invest in you mm -hmm. in turn the manufacturer so because that that is the big problem is that everybody's asking for a miracle and no one's willing to put their money where their mouth is and there is money available you know yeah. from you know big business to governments and and they, there should be more support in this yeah. in this area i think because otherwise you know you can't do what you want to do because you've yeah. not quite yeah. got to that point yet absolutely and and like you mentioned as well yolanda you know it's really important to be transparent. You're not 100% eco, but you're trying. And, you know, to start somewhere is really important. But then I think also um, a lot of, of people get hung up with kind of like, oh, well, if I, like we talked about the bypass, well, if I use an alternative, um, isn't that creating a problem somewhere else? And some alternatives do create problems somewhere else. Um, but then it goes to this point of conscious consumerism, which goes against the kind of capitalistic society that we've built and been sold of buy more, 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 which every brand needs. Obviously, everyone wants to sell as much as possible. But, you know, even if you're using aluminium, it might be causing an issue somewhere else or glass is using more energy near the start of its life. Um, so how can we then, you know, put into ourselves this mindful consumer of do I need this? Don't I need this? how can I use this product more effectively than just one try and throw it away? Absolutely. Ban the shelfie, I say. Oh, my goodness. I can't bear those. I can't bear a shelfie. I think it's the it's most- so vulgar. I, I find it totally vulgar. That's exactly the word I use. I just think it's so vulgar. It's like, I don't want to see how many products you use. I'm sorry. It's not yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I totally agree. Um, okay, moving on. So this question is open to everyone. So there appears to be a lot of greenwashing, as we've kind of discussed in the industry, um, where some brands are claiming to be more environmentally conscious than, than perhaps they really are. Um, so I think we have made it pretty clear that the term that I personally hate is, oh, we're sustainable because we're recyclable when the world is not recycling it. Um, so what are some of the terms that you've heard that you, you feel really really you know need we, we need a discussion around to really expose what they truly mean there's so many i mean i i personally i think the certification thing the, the situation needs to be evened out um and sort of level it needs to be a level playing field because i think some brands can't afford to pay for a certification to be on the front of pack i think if you look at the back of the so, uh, our courage to change report which by the way is free to download on our website you will see that there are a number of certification um, uh, certification organizations and I think that's very confusing to the consumer absolutely I think yeah. one of the examples you know, I saw yeah. recently was someone used EcoCert and claimed that they were organic but in fact when we looked at it the organic content was like nine or ten percent and it was actually eco the EcoCert for natural that they had yeah. but actually they just used EcoCert and were claiming they were organic we're not we're not quite there yeah. in terms of food you know how food is you know we don't have this sort of traffic light system we're not quite um i mean part of the work part of the mandate of the sustainable beauty coalition is to because we are a sort of collective of different organizations from across the sector is to really challenge that and to really mm -hmm. work on the claims because it that is a problem again just yeah. confusing the consumer absolutely yeah greenwashing is like completely unacceptable it really undermines the brands like yours yolanda that are really trying to do good work and you know that I think in the beauty you know you hear like as you're saying organic natural uh, clean recyclable but if there's also not strong definitions and rigid definitions around these terms in the industry from a regulation perspective then it is very easy for brands to exploit and increase profitability off the back of these words so you know from the industry perspective like the great work you're doing with the councillors you know how can those definitions be more strict so brands can't take advantage and you know start doing these bogus certification programs Mm -hmm. Maybe there's a way of sort of um, grading it or something similar to SPF. I don't know. I mean, I'm not entirely mm -hmm. sure what the solution is. Yeah. You know, we have a steering committee that will decipher what they're, you know, what they, they suggest. But, you know, it is really a problem. And, you know, you can walk down the aisle of Waitrose and buy organic food. And then you think you're buying an organic shampoo on the next aisle and it's nowhere near 
exactly. organic and it is very very confusing and I think it's misrepresentation actually it and is. I, I think it's a you know again that comes back to the responsibility of the beauty industry and how we've been quite irresponsible actually um, yeah I think we're get, we'll get caught out we are getting caught out it's time for us to sort of do the right thing uh, absolutely I think you know this the standardization and governance around it is is so key but until that point you know what I would urge other brands to do is define it for themselves you know instead of just claiming on your website that you're sustainable you know interpret that for the customer and let them decide whether they truly believe that they that you are you know or you're not um and I think that's that's what that's what we need to do in the interim Ben is there anything that that is a yeah, just from a packaging perspective, one of the things that I see most often is um, things marked as being biodegradable, mm -hmm. which is quite a broad spectrum, slightly wishy-washy uh, term, which, I, I mean, it means that things will, will decompose naturally over time, but the problem is it doesn't specify any conditions and it doesn't specify how long. So just because something biodegrade, I mean, a, a tree will biodegrade, but it will take thousands of years to do that. Um, and we need a little bit more, and this is where composting, you know, falls within the biodegradable um, uh, term, but under slightly more specific conditions in terms of where it's, you know, how long it's going to take to, to compost and, and the conditions that are required, because it's quite a specific condition as well. So just because something says it's uh, biodegradable doesn't it doesn't give us enough um, information, I don't think. So it's something that can often be used um, and sounds quite appealing and sounds like we're, 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 we're doing something quite green when in actual fact, it doesn't sort of give us enough information on, on how long that will take. Mm -hmm. I wonder sometimes if it's the size of our products that is a challenge in terms of getting information across. Mm. So if it was like, if you walk down a shelf and each product was massive and it had the information on it, really clear information it's because our our packs are so small yeah. sometimes so you've got all these little certifications you've got the little sort of you know how how long after opening you've got an inky list you know and then you've got sort of our various different you know is it recyclable or recycled or refillable or whatever it is a lot of that information is tiny yeah yeah mm. and you know, at least saying that it's like you know we can't make it sort of more um readable that's true i think you know we're limited with the footprint that we have on pack but you know with the trend moving well it, it was moving consumer behavior of purchasing beauty products online pre-covid and it's certainly exploded you know during and post i think that's where our opportunity lies you know both on our own websites as an education piece of it if we see it physically in store you know we're we're constantly connected to our phones anyway so when we're in store i quite often um, you know, for the contents, for example, I use Think Dirty. You can scan a barcode and it'll tell you yeah. how clean really the ingredients are. So, you know, using, you know, the, the information available online um, to, to help us navigate that, I think, is, is key. Yeah. Um, and, and we've we, become really used to QR codes now with COVID. Yeah. So, you know, there's no reason why we actually can't have a green QR code that sits on right. every shelf that actually allows people to sort of scan it and get information right there in front Absolutely. of them. Absolutely. Otherwise, we have QR codes on our, on our packaging. So so inside the wallet, there are clear instructions on uh, the materials that we're using, how to dispose of them correctly. Everything's very clear. And if you want further information on what we're doing, you can scan the QR code and that will take you through to the website, which will give you more information. If you really want to nerd out on composting and anaerobic digestion and, and uh, more about bioplastics as well and, and the, the, how they can you know, practically be used and whether or not they are things that can be used for other applications. Um, so yeah, absolutely. I think transparency information, um, giving people the resources um, to, to make informed decisions is really important. Absolutely. Uh, well, on that note, it's not all bad. There are some brands and some retailers that are you know, making some moves to, to get things right. Um, so for example, Look Fantastic actually was the first uh, online retailer in collaboration with, with Plastic Free Beauty Day to put plastic free as a shoppable category. And that's a really good first step. You know, we, we very much believe if you can shop vegan, if you can shop cruelty free, why not give the consumers what they want and allow them to choose 
by a plastic free. So I hope they're on the call. Thank you. Look fantastic. That's one of the first great moves that that all retailers I think can take. Um, you know, hopefully as a takeaway after today. Um, so I really just thought, you know, on that note of, of positive change, um, what retailers or cons uh, sorry or brands have you seen that have done something positive? Um, and uh, yeah, I think that's that would be helpful to share. Um, I think such companies that are offering to refill products for consumers, um, so like a circular way of shopping for beauty, I think that's quite interesting. I mean, I know it's not taken off and obviously with COVID, it's kind of a step backwards because obviously not as many of us are going to shop and so we're more inclined to, to shop online. Um, but this way of offering to refill products um, is a nice idea. I'm not sure if Ben has the practicalities around that, but yeah, well, that's what we're trying to do. That, so that's our, our our aim, really. So it's um, not to detract people from uh, being able to use the products which they love, but to be able to continue using them, but not to have all the packaging that goes with it. Um, and moving towards a less linear use of packaging uh, and towards a more circular one. So, you know, can you uh, repurpose the, the packaging? Can you compost the packaging? um so that you're you're not left with any long-lasting impact mm -hmm. um i've seen that the government are uh, consulting at the moment with supermarkets just in terms of like large-scale retailers to potentially offer refills in store mm -hmm. which is a great move you know and, and again i think it just a point from earlier on which i thought was really interesting is that you know it, it needs you know, widespread sharing of information and collectively, I think it's beneficial for everybody to be getting involved with this. The more people are doing it, the, 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 the quicker we will, you know, solve this, solve this problem. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Great. I mean, I think Beauty Kitchen is great. I think that the, you know, how, how well um, they operate that circular piece, I think is really clever. I think she's great, Jo. Um, you know, I'm a big fan of super size. <laughs> I yeah. just I still don't understand why everything has to be 250 mil. It seems so small to me. And, and you know, I think sort of larger refillable packs, bottles, et cetera, would be great. Uh, I think Cold Beauty and Provenance is, is, is a retailer uh, and an organization that have done something collaboratively that I think has been very beneficial. Mm -hmm. uh, again, going back to that whole QR code thing, um, you know, I use a QR code to look at a menu, to check in somewhere, um, and I, I just think that information is important. Refillable in store is important. I, I live up the road from a Planet Organic. Yeah. Get a little afraid when I pull that lever and the nuts come flying out all over the floor. But you know, I think that you know that that to me is is something that should be in every single supermarket, every single beauty retailer. We should be able to refill our mm -hmm. our, our products. Planet Organic have this great thing where you can buy the brown bottles and you can refill. Um, your Epsom salts, for example, you know, I think that's amazing. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I have two daughters and there's a lot of hair in this house. So large sizes, please, yeah. everyone just create large sizes for people like me. Um, because I just, I don't know what, what is with the 250, I still don't get it. Just No, I have no idea. And also you're always out of shampoo quicker than you're out of conditioner. Oh, and everything's I'm out of conditioner quicker than I'm out of shampoo. Oh, I'm are you? Wa I'm obviously oh, washing my hair wrong. <laughs> I just, I require a lot. It's just, that's weird, isn't it? Because you're always out of one before the other. Yeah, totally agree. Um, um, no, I, I totally take your point on the, the super size thing. It actually, um, we just launched super sizes, so one liters uh, instead. And it's, so it's basically the equivalent of four of our small bottles. So even that alone as a change means that a consumer is using three less pumps, you know, yeah. three less plastic pumps. Exactly. Exactly. So yeah, I think super sizes, I think, you know, there, there's brands, as you say, like Beauty Kitchen that are clever with their materials. They use actually a lot of aluminium, um, yeah. I know as well. Yeah. And uh, yeah, thinking about the, the reuse um, and also reduction in consumption. You know, I think brands that offer multi-use products is very kind of key to how we should move forward. You know, one of our uh, products, the Paradox, is uh, an oil that is a face, hair, and body oil. Um, I think Nooks have one, and theirs is in a, a glass container and so on. And I think, you know, already you're not buying three products to, to solve those problems. It's, it's one, I think, reduction in consumption is a, a big thing as well. 
And also some brands like Lush, they're doing like hard um, shampoo bars, um, soaps, which then that avoids the plastic or the aluminium packaging altogether. Um, and they're actually really good. So yeah, they are. I think like, like, sorry, go on. But it's, it's that idea of the habits of, you know, it feels strange using a hard bar of shampoo versus in a bottle that we're so used to. Yeah. No, but that's the education piece, isn't it? That's where we need to educate the consumers. I was actually just thinking when you talked about, when you mentioned nukes, because if you think about Elizabeth Arden's eight hour cream, a lot of times the multi-purpose products, are the ones that stay iconic for decades and decades, mm -hmm. handed down from generation to generation. Mm -hmm. You know, if you look at something like, I don't know, Sudacrem or something, or, you know, like I said, eight hour cream or that nukes oil, um, or I want to say Cl Clarins, there's an mm -hmm. oil that Clarins done, is it Blue Orchid? Anyway, there's there are certain, products that people have you know brands have created that that are multi-purpose yeah. that have been with us for generations mm -hmm. and those are the ones that stick around yeah yeah because they really work they so they solve that problem and 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 you know in this busy lifestyle that we have that's what consumers are, are asking for is products that save them time and and uh and kind of energy and, and whatever so yeah. I think it's that's part of it too. Um, okay, just wrapping up before the, the questions then. Um, this is again for everyone. What is your one piece of advice? I mean, I know everyone on the call is maybe, you know, press or from a retailer or, you know, in the industry, but at the end of the day, we're all kind of consumers and, and human beings as well. So what is your one piece of advice to everyone on the call, taking one small step today to be more environmentally conscious? Size matters. No, I'm just um, Yes, it does. Um, yes, <laughs> let's get that out. Um, I, I personally, uh, for me, it's about being more vocal, um, collaboration, working together, like you said, being open source, be it sharing resource, um, knowing that we're in this together, we live on the same planet, we're not, um, we're not really as isolated as, as yeah. we think. Um, and, just being really vocal and loud about it because I think that if we don't talk about it and have forums like this um I think we're just going to end up in the same position as we are today 20 years from now and that's not good enough it's just mm -hmm. not good enough yeah Daisy. yeah I would say you know along this the same kind of message that's been reinforced throughout this entire conversation about conscious consumerism um, our choices that we make at home and there's just many simple switches that you can make for example avoid like spraying deodorant use roll-on um, and especially to protect our oceans there's lots of for example sun creams that are incredibly polluting harming our coral reefs um, but you can buy um, ocean friendly sun cream so to look out for that next time you go on your holiday if you like to swim and yeah just being mindful and there's just one more thing that I want to touch upon that I saw someone had mentioned in in the chat about price point and I think that's so important in this sustainability conversation because we we tend to be afraid and we always think that actually being more sustainable is more expensive and maybe that's part of the greenwashing where brands have uh, presented sustainable products, organic, et cetera, as more expensive because it's luxury, even though they may not be meeting the actual criteria. Um, but I think also it's slightly myth and there are ways as well, like if you just, you know, buy less, but buy better, or even for example, people think that, you know, having a vegan diet is much more expensive. It's not because you're not actually buying expensive meat and fish, you know, beans are much cheaper to live on. So the price around buying sustainable products is always kind of scary, but if you do it mindfully, and again, do your research and your education, et cetera, it can be less expensive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ben? Um, I think, uh, yeah, just, just be more, you know, I think we can all be more mindful of, of when we're buying something, uh, what it's packaged in uh, and whether or not, you know, question whether or not we can buy this in, a, in alternative packaging or without, you know, without any plastic packaging at all. Um, I, I think that's really important. It's something that, you know, and, and what we're talking about here is changing uh, our habits. Mm -hmm. And part of the problem is that habitually we've always done this a certain way, which is using plastic. And it takes um, a while to sort of change those habits and get used to using things and consuming things in a way which which doesn't use plastics um so yeah just i think every time you purchase something 
question whether or not you can purchase that thing without the packaging that it comes in or in sustainable uh, packaging that doesn't use uh, plastics. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I think for me, it's it's looking for the materials and taking a second before you purchase to to question what that material is and make a switch, you know. For mm. me, it was changing from plastic toothbrushes to bamboo toothbrushes, um, mm. moving from toothpaste, which we all, every, every single one of us on the call uses toothpaste. You know, there's there's great brands like um, Parla, for example, that do, you know, solid toothpaste, yeah. uh, little capsule things. Um, a paradox, we use aluminium instead of plastic in, in our, um, our bottles. So it's just about, and, and watch out for eco refills, guys. The amount of brands that I have seen that have produced these, you know, packs like um for their eco refills and they're plastic yeah. i'm like that defeats the whole purpose so um yeah just just watch out for materials and 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 just start to search out alternatives because there are alternatives pretty much in every category that there's going um i think as well if you, if you love a brand um right and you use their products regularly write to them and say am i able to buy this in a, in a plastic free packaging Mm -hmm. because I will definitely keep buying it if you you know but I don't want to keep buying it if I continuously have to keep buying a brand new plastic bottle or anything plastic really I was going to um, say exactly the same thing make demands on the brands you know I think that some most of us are pretty brand loyal it's a really good idea I mean just to keep the pressure up mm -hmm. absolutely yeah I agree um well thank you so much for that we're going to move uh into Q&A uh that was a little bit longer than intended but I think everyone has enjoyed the the conversation uh so let me just bring up a few questions and um I'll take this in no particular order uh oh this is a great one actually so um Amanda uh you work in the tv industry as a hair and makeup artist and your question is Due to the pandemic, we have been forced to increase the amount of plastic for hygiene purposes, so disposables, containers, visors, etc. How can we get away from this if the COVID safety measures remain for 2022 and beyond? Great question. It's really difficult because I think that sort of globally, this is a challenge, isn't it, with the PPE? And we have raised this quite a lot with government. I mean, I think my daughter takes the straps, the the mm -hmm. ear straps off her masks before yep. she puts them um, in the recycling bin. So I think that, um, um, I don't know is the answer personally. I mean, I think that it's it's a very difficult situation that we find ourselves in because we're being forced to wear um, all of this PPE. Yeah. Um, and it is causing a pretty dire waste issue, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I was so glad to see um, the fashion industry's instant response to that by producing, you know, fabric reusable masks, at least that yeah. we can put into our washing machine. And that was out in an instant. And I guess that's that's the type of agility that, you know, our industries need when things like this happen, you know, to, to really act quickly to give other solutions. Yeah. There are some, you know, like the, the visors and, and masks that can only really be produced in plastic. Um, so I think it's, you know, recognizing that, you know, especially in the medical industry, you know, where they're they're doing surgeries and they have to wear those, that there's going to be some plastic that has to be acceptable. But let's take responsibility for what we do, you know, after it's in use. Yeah, the challenge is, though, is that the close contact services have to wear the type two masks, which are the surgical masks. We're not allowed to wear face covering. Yeah, yeah that's so true. So it's all very well having that face covering and reusable or washable when you're out and about doing a bit of shopping at the supermarket, but hairdressers, makeup artists aren't allowed to wear that. So yeah. they've mandated yeah. as law that we have to wear the type two, which is a challenge, but. Yeah, it is. Yeah, I, th I think the main thing, as you mentioned, Millie, is disposing of um, the equipment that you're using uh, the best that you can. Again, like in the UK, it's quite confusing because each borough has different recycling rules and different things. So, you know, understanding what you can and can't recycle from the, the, the items that you're using, disposing correctly where you can, accepting and acknowledging, even though it's horrible, the fact that there are certain things that we can't not use at the moment. And so we, you know, they will end up in landfill and, you know, in our oceans, um, but where you can use reusable things in situations which are possible then to use reusable items. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 
I think compostables might have a, a role to play here as well uh, for things like you know gloves and masks and things which are flexible plastics um, they tend to lend themselves better to um, compostability than, than rigid plastics obviously because they're flexible and they're much lighter and I've read some cases as well where they're trialing um, sort of closed loop uh, systems so for example at festivals or large events where they can collect everything and they know everything is exactly the same material and it's much more easy to process that than if you're processing things which are recyclable, compostable, made from different materials. You can't then segregate those things and that makes it much harder to, um, to process in the end. So similarly, perhaps with a, a TV set or a film set, if you're working somewhere where you know that everything can be collected in one place, um, you know, that could be an example where you could kind of create a closed loop system that uh, meant you didn't have any contamination. Yeah. Yeah, contamination is a problem as well, isn't it? Yeah, you know, so so it, it is a it is a challenge, I think, and um, it is something that we have raised with the government, but we don't necessarily have a solution at the moment. So I think we have to, as Daisy said, in a way, you yeah, kind of have to pick your battles. Mm -hmm. You know, I think we have to be as responsible as we can, but obviously, understanding that safety is paramount. Yeah, uh, Zoe Veers actually has just mentioned there's a great organization called the Green Salon Collective who collect PP items and return and turn them into renewable energy. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the, you know, the, so there are organizations tackling these things. It's about, you know, us doing our own research to see, well, well what is out there and, and how do I, you know, get involved? So I mean, maybe if, 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 if you email join me at British Beauty Council, maybe what we could do is put a list of yep. all of the links that everyone on this on this panel on yeah, the webinar idea. has been talking about so we can have a resource list yeah. um, which might be really helpful to people that are asking the questions yeah um another question then so uh from charlotte black so what are your views on the fast beauty brands that are throwing products at consumers left right and center um, now labeling products as bio are recyclable. Are they doing more harm than good? Yeah, but I think you touched on that earlier, Millie, the, the constant um, desire from retailers and, and some consumers as well for new, new, newness. Um, so what do you feel about that? Well, you know, I don't like it, but it's so different. I'm the you know, CEO of the British Beauty Council and I, I'm i saying stop buying <laughs> so much product. Um, yeah, I, I think it's a challenge. I think it's a real problem. You know, we want to support profitability of our brands, you know, and of the industry, but equal, equally what we want to do is reduce consumerism because we, it's damaging. And so, you know, when I was, when I started my career, you would see sort of two launches a year of new products, you know, March, September, then maybe it was seasonal. So four times a year. Now it's just every, every other day, there's something new launching. Um, Got to be difficult for media to keep up. You know, it's difficult in terms of, you know, every time you launch something new as a brand, you've got to change your shop fit and you've got to add components to your display. Mm -hmm. And, you know, then you've got all the marketing add-ons and all the extra materials that you're using to promote those products. And it's all new, 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 new. And it's, I, I find it really overwhelming and just, and it feels a little bit toxic in just the, the, the whole, the concept of it doesn't feel um right to me and you know um and like i said you know there's a iconic brands a skin food eight hour cream you know these are products people have been using for years and years and years um and that are multi-purpose products and they are amazing and do we constantly need something that's new i don't i mm -hmm. you know think of clever ways of marketing your products yeah. it doesn't always have to be around a new launch yeah yeah i agree um, okay, I think we'll maybe ask one more question. Um, I think we've touched on the, we've got a lot around what's inside the product, but I think we've talked about that uh, with microplastics and so on. There is a really good app, and I don't know if somebody mentioned it, where you can scan and you can see what plastic is in a product. I saw it on Twitter. I know oh, we'll, put that, we'll put that as part of our... Yeah, I want to say Walida posted about it, um, which... Um, is super clever. I've yeah. got menopause brain. I can't remember what happened yesterday. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have baby brains, so we've kind of got both things covered. Um, the spectrum, you know. <laughs> yeah. uh, okay, final question then. Um, I'll pick. Uh, so, Sarah, uh, there are so many barriers for small businesses to go green. 
how do we give access to more eco-friendly packaging to small businesses when most suppliers require really high minimum order uh, quantities for eco-packaging, which I kind of mentioned earlier on. Uh, this, small, this pushes small companies out. How can we bring small business together to make orders together to break the MOQ barrier? I think that's really, really clever. Um, I think that's part of the work that Millie's probably, you know, doing with the Sustainable Beauty Council is, or sorry, coalition is, you know, together we are stronger um, mm -hmm. and together we can put pressure on that supply chain. So Daisy um, mentioned something about this the other day, that la the larger companies need to be supporting, the, you know, the young, the smaller businesses and, you know, they can learn a lot from those smaller businesses, but those smaller businesses don't have the resources that the larger companies have. So if they want to have access to, the innovation. Mm -hmm. I mean, generally speaking, that's why some of the large companies buy the smaller brands, isn't it? Because they've got innovative founders that they want access to. Yeah. Um, so that's, you know, but yeah, Daisy, um, Daisy's mentioned that and I think that's really critical. Actually, Daisy, you mentioned something the other day. I'm going to do one more question because I think this is really, really key. Um, so isn't it more about addressing why any type of packaging ends up at the uh, in the ocean at the end of life and we haven't really discussed that um you know lots about that so why why is all this plastic ending up there yeah I mean the thing is is that we just don't have the correct um waste management systems to dispose correctly of the amount of waste that we create so um our rubbish either gets burnt which um releases you know emissions into the air or um, European countries, I mean, this is being stopped more recently, but um, have just been shipping their plastics to Asia and to other countries to deal with it. So instead of actually taking responsibility for ourselves, we've been sticking all our plastic in different materials on boats and shipping it to Asia and hoping they'll solve the problem, which is just impossible um, when we when they don't have the infrastructure to be able to do that. Um, but, you know, it's just kind of pushing around the responsibility of what we do with so much rubbish and plastics that we're using and we're creating. Um, and, and I also saw someone in the chat as well mention that about they were trying to educate young people about beauty packaging and products, but they just didn't seem to care because they didn't get that it was actually ending up in the oceans and, and polluting our waterways. And it is really hard to tell that narrative, but that's why it's so important that um, organizations like ours, Ocean Generation, and I saw, um, I think there was Plastic Soup and some others as well in the chat, you know, that these organizations exist to be able to create the educational resources um, to educate young people about this gap and, you know, where when you throw something away, where it ends up and how do we tell those stories. And more and more because of platforms like social media, we have such a great opportunity to reach a wider audience, but we also need to get more creative with our content. Um, you know, attention spans are getting shorter. We want everything now, now, now. So how can we start um, telling this story of, you know, everything is interconnected. We need to protect our planet. We need to protect our oceans. And, you know, it falls on us as individuals. We all can, can play our part and make conscious decisions um, to help our planet. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, I think that's all we've got time for. Thank you to everyone for joining. Um, we didn't get to all of the questions, but I'm gonna take a note of them and we're going to address a lot of that on our social media. So if you want to follow us, we are plas at Plastic Free Beauty Day on Instagram and we will try and address everything that's been asked. We'll also share the links that um, Millie mentioned earlier on. We'll put that um, on our stories too. And uh, and yeah, thank you for being part of what, you know, we all believe is a, a truly urgent and important uh, topic. And I think, you know, with everyone's interest today, you know, small changes will start to make change. And it is about, I think that's the big thing that's come out of today is, at every single level, it requires change at consumer, retail, brand, and government and country level, um, you know, as well. So uh, I think, you know, hopefully with, with people like us on the call today, um, we will start to see that change. So thank you very much. And um, I hope you have a great uh, weekend. Thank you for hosting. Thank you so much. Thanks very much. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Thank you.